Good evening and welcome to the Force to Freedom podcast on the Seeds of Liberty Network. You can find us at theseedsofliberty.com on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. Um, my co-host slash uh, hetero life mate is Lloyd. <laughs> uh, this evening we will be of volunteerism for the first official show and what it's all about, how how we go about attacking a problem, understanding um, the methodology. I mean, I consider here give you a bunch of ideas, but it's really more about methods. It's, uh, and with that, I'm going to let let Lloyd take a take a stretch here and and have a run with it. So, give me your rundown of volunteerism, Lloyd. Right. So, uh, volunteerism is the the core concept is. Uh, you can you can phrase it in a couple of ways. Uh, uh, the snarky kind of fun way uh, for those who understand it is, hey, here's this radical concept: people aren't property. <laughs> so that's one way of of saying it. But if you're not speaking to someone uh, familiar with volunteerism or uh, libertarian principles and the reasoning that underwrites these things, the basic principle is that all it, it, it's it's a it's a moral claim the basic principle is a moral claim and that is that all human interactions should be voluntary no obfuscation of that of that voluntary interaction through abstractions like the social contract or you know a, a mob rule otherwise known as democracy whatever none of these things but that all interactions should be voluntary. Um, so that's the that's the very very basic principle. That's the that's the moral claim, and this is one of the reasons why uh, there's so much infighting among uh, among voluntarists, libertarians, all all, all manner of uh, people under the libertarian umbrella. Bananas. Right. And I can tell, <laughs> I, I kind of get in of the, you know, the break with the libertarian idea is there's a, the, the big L libertarian is the party and the little L libertarian is the method. And yeah. the libertarian party isn't much different than Republican or Democrat. It's still, it's claiming to hold to certain ideas. But when you get back to that core methodology, it's really, we're going to use the state to enact these ideas, which is an authoritarian method, even though the ideas tend to be a little, uh, you know, liberty minded. Right. And, and, you know, the first time I was actually uh, familiarized with the difference between big L and little L libertarian uh, was during a uh, reason.com like live stream kind of thing uh, they had uh, mm -hmm. some years ago. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch were like answering uh, video calls and stuff. And they would. You know, they would preface each question by, you know, saying the, on the person's name and whether they were a big L or small L libertarian. And I was like, what the hell is this? So I started looking into it because they never defined those terms. They just assumed their audience knew. And I assume most of them did. I was less knowledgeable at that time. And I came, look, looked into it. And that's, you know, that was one of the exposures to principles that I had. And uh, so at that point, I, I understood uh, little l libertarian to be a reference to a philosophy, whereas capital L was simply in reference to the formal uh, political party. Uh, cool. So, uh, but yeah, to get back to the uh, the, the basics, uh, you know, the, the moral claim uh, it causes a lot of infighting within the uh, libertarian umbrella because not all libertarians are moralists. A uh, great number, actually are economists and ultimately again and this is something <laughs> this, this is one of those things that the economically minded and the philosophically minded which are not exactly inseparable uh, mm -hmm. this is a this is a, where a great deal of conflict occurs within the movement if you want to call it that uh, because the economists are not really typically th those who are attracted to the economic arguments are not really attracted to the actual principle which you know uh, underwrites the entire philosophy which is right. hey you know <laughs> everything should be voluntary that's a should that's a moral claim yeah and they they just will not reconcile that 
So there's a, you know, there's there's an emotional reason for that. People don't want to do that because you know when you start making moral claims, you start making enemies, and you start upsetting people. Whereas you can talk about the Laffer curve and you know uh, anything else until your eyes bleed, and nobody tends to get too crazy emotional about it. Mm-hmm. So, that's, um, that's, but yeah, that's interesting because I don't I don't come at it either way. I, I don't come from the economics or philosophy side. I come from the logic side. The, the burden of proof is always on the active claim. So if you're going to say that, that two people are going to voluntarily exchange, if you're going to claim that one of them has to be forced to do something, uh, the burden of proof is on you. And all of those burdens fall flat. I see the, the wisdom in having a consistent philosophy. I see the wisdom in understanding how the voluntary interactions happen in the economic field and in the market but at the end of the day i i go back to basic fundamental principles you know the non uh the principle of non-contradiction the consistency principle um and just the fact that the burden of proof is always on one making the active claim it doesn't sure. you know make the passive claim default it doesn't mean you're automatically a winner because you've taken the passive claim but the, the burden of proof does shift away to where, you know, these two people, you know, two people sitting in two chairs in a room and they shake hands and exchange whatever property they have. And the third party says, no, you can't do that. Now that third party has to fill in all those gaps and uh, they can't seem to do that. No. <sighs> and, and this, this comes back to uh, uh, the fundamental reason why philosophy is so important. Logic is a discipline within philosophy mm-hmm. as is, you know, as is, uh, you know, ethics, you know, or, you know, which is, a, you know, how to, how to live a moral life, basically, the pursuit of, of virtue. Right. Uh, and there's many, many, many uh, schools of ethics, uh, ethical thought there. But, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a great deal of variety in this. But principally, they tend to come down to these two general things, the philosophy or the economics. And the philosophy encompasses ethics and logic and, you know, uh, <laughs> argumentation ethics i mean all kinds of things right and you do there's a great deal of overlap between the philosophical side and the economic side and rarely does one encounter somebody who only does one and not the other like i yeah. run into many 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 people who do both uh and i don't run into too many people who just do economics because you kind of can't because philosophy is the a priori uh, discipline for all rational studies like economics or the scientific method i mean it's it's the starting point for how we, how to understand the world yeah i have a, i have a little trouble uh mixing my logic with my philosophy because uh well i i, I guess i don't want to say i don't mix them um if your core fundamental philosophy has nothing to do with any logical or rational basis well, that's great, but what happens when we, you know, if you're going to expect this to apply to another person, then then there has to be some sort of logical basis for that. But if you declare, oh, well, my, my, my philosophy has nothing to do with logic or reason, well, that's great, but then you expect that to apply to other people, you have no fundamental support for a philosophy other than my feels, therefore, take the whip. Right, and so that's kind of like one of the vernacular uses of the term philosophy. Yeah. It's uh, as a replacement for the more accurate term belief system. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not all belief systems are valid or oh, not, yeah. or, or even equal. Uh, yeah. I mean, there are plenty out there that are more rational than others and very, very few that are rational and uh, certainly an incredibly few uh, that I'm, I still say – a few because I acknowledge my own ignorance. So there may be other things other than what I know, which may yeah. be entirely valid and logical that I just yeah. don't. There, yeah, there's there, there's a lot of people who don't acknowledge their own ignorance. Yeah, like that. that was my, that was, and you know, this is often one of the biggest problems is people's vanity and their mm-hmm. inability to recognize their own limitations. I mean, I, if, for all my, for all of what I know and my life experiences, there's a, but ton, I don't know, and I just go, mm-hmm. and and you know, generally, I'm, I try simply try to approach. 
you know, in, in, in social interactions and discussions from this stance where I don't want to be the, the uh, first year physics student walking into a symposium and arguing with the guy with a doctorate in, flo- in uh, physics about how his claims are wrong. Yeah. Are, are, are you daft? I mean, you're just yeah. getting laughed out of the room. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, so I don't get into discussions that I don't know much about. Otherwise, yeah. I'm just going to look, otherwise I'm gonna, just going to appear like all this libertards out there. Yeah. A lot so. of people walking around like Goodwill hunting. Yeah. 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 How do you exactly. like them apples? So, exactly. So, yeah. And so if, you know, it's so for me in my mind, and it, this isn't a necessarily a false dichotomy, maybe there's some other distinctions I'm not aware of, but it kind of breaks down to an economics or philosophy, and there's a great deal of overlap. I, I mean, it would be interesting to see a Venn diagram on that, actually. Probably be interesting. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of overlap, but people tend to break down into these two things, and these are the methods by which uh, voluntarists dismantle all arguments to, uh, that to further favor the, the state. So I guess to further the discussion a little along here of, I, I think we, we kind of beat the, this is why we're here, this is, this is our understanding of things. And then uh, the, the, the tools that we use to come to these conclusions, economics and philosophy. And, you know, if you're sitting there, if, you, if you're even mildly have an understanding of what we're talking about, you're like, oh, is that all? You know, economics and philosophy, you know, people tackling economics for the last couple hundred years and philosophy for the, for the, for the last couple thousand. And, uh, oh, is that all I have to learn to, to have a greater understanding? Well, uh, yeah. I don't know if there's a way to dodge it. Uh, I see a lot of anti-intellectualism, like you're saying, people hopping on the libertarian bandwagon because, oh, well, I don't support gay marriage, so I must be a libertarian. And and there it is. Uh, that's, you know, it's one of those things where you can agree with the individual on that individual uh, right. belief and still go, yeah, no. <laughs> you're, but right. good step in the right direction, you know? Right. Uh, my, my favorite is Austin Peterson. For, for those of you new to the libertarian voluntarist world, Austin Peterson is a big L libertarian. And when you actually start asking him the hard questions, he goes right, right into the MSNBC shill lunatic bin about how he thinks, you know, everything has to be an authoritarian, top down controlled, uh, you know, centrally defined words and all of it. Like, you know, seriously crazy, but he makes his money off the libertarian uh moniker so he really kind of he has to lash himself to that and sure. he's a great he's a great uh example of contradiction yeah he's one of those people like because he's effectively uh, attached to politicians he's mm-hmm. you know under the same kind of uh scrutiny and suspicion because politicians have to lie to retain power and to obtain power they have to it's just mm-hmm. part of the job. Even the most principled ones lie, equivocate, uh, create ex post facto rationalizations. Uh, even Ron Paul. I mean, you know, the, yep. the godfather of, you know, virtue in, in Congress for low for 30 years. Ex post facto rationalizations for subsidies up the butt. Yep. So, yeah. Um, and so he's much the same, you know, only he's a media whore. So he's like yeah. infinitely worse. The core concept for everybody who, uh, who's just, you know, like, like we said in our first episode, we are really about bringing this to the military guys. That's what we used to do. And we're trying to, to bring this to a, a consistent, rational system of ethics and why we do things. At no point are you going to hear Lloyd and I say, because the Constitution says so. <laughs> no. that, that's not how the rationalization and that's not how a deeper understanding works it's you, you can't just show up and make excuses and one of the one of the things uh that you can look up if you want uh, i want to say it's logicalfallacies.org but it, there are a huge lists of logical fallacies that a lot of people make and they convince themselves that they've got themselves a really good core principled understanding of why they do things and how they do things and then they get to that level and they quit they stop learning and they don't question it anymore and that belief is pretty much what holds everything together. It has nothing to do with any kind of consistent logic, rational basis for making decisions. 
Right, and, and it should be pointed out just as a little thing there because a lot of people who first start touching upon uh, research into rhetoric and, and this, the, the fallacies this is part of, uh, a rhetoric and, you know, a, a subdiscipline within uh, philosophy. Just because you use a fallacy does not mean you're wrong. It just means yep. your crap, your, your argument sucks. It can definitely be improved upon. Uh, and like, this is one reason why I do not make analogies because I tend to veer off really badly and make really, really bad arguments and stuff when I start going into analogies. Some people are great at it, others not so much. Anyway, uh, so the, so th this is just one of the things you got to keep in mind. Just because you can catch somebody in a fallacy doesn't mean they're wrong. Right. It just means they need to clarify their argument better because uh, they, they, they might be wrong. Uh, I'll throw you out an example. When Austin Peterson says uh, the earth is a sphere, that's <laughs> after all of the other fallacies that he could make, he's not incorrect just because of that. It's yeah. not a, well, yeah. that was a very poor analogy of a plea to authority. It really was. But uh, <laughs> that was right. just terrible. So, that was just straight up terrible. Just, yeah, this is why I don't go into analogies. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean. But, That's rare you know, for if, me. If Usually like, I'm pretty good. Right. So so if he, you, you know, uh, he made that claim and I and I responded with, ah, oh, that, that guy's a dumbass. Therefore, the earth must actually be flat. Well, that would be a bad conclusion based on an ad hominem fallacy, right. which would actually be, you know, an incorrect. Not only, you know, uh, the fallacy would indicate my argument was not only wrong, but not even sourced in anything remotely approaching reason or evidence. Well, let me clean that trash up. If Stephen Hawking says the earth is flat and you get, say, well, Stephen Hawking says the earth is flat, therefore it must be flat. That's right. a plea to authority. Even though right. Stephen Hawking is a is a master in his field, he can still be wrong. Mm -hmm. And then when you say, "Well, he's wrong because he's a dumbass," well, that's not why he's wrong. That's an ad hominem fallacy. And you'll get a lot of these things as we go through uh, through the through the news articles that we're going to be doing in the upcoming weeks, and as we hit these topics more in depth, um, you'll see how logic plays a big part in both philosophy and economics and how remaining consistent is what starts to separate the difference between Republican and Democrat and how there really are the same thing. I mean, I don't see them as all that much different. Right. So there's a, so there's a couple of different um, things that we can go into. Uh, so the basic breakdown being uh, economics and philosophy. Uh, I'm fairly comfortable with either, but I'm far more comfortable with philosophy than I am economics. I know what my weak points are. I know my strengths. Um, economics, I understand uh, macro theory pretty well, uh, especially because you know uh, it it all comes back to uh, motive, and that's a bit of psychology and philosophy combined to really understand what drives people to act. So. Uh, you know, we can uh, we can approach either, and uh, which which would you like to go go forward first? I'm um, looking at our time. I think we're just going to do a brief overview of of each one, and then sure. what they bring to the table in their individual components. Sure. Um, so economics. Okay. So the 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 big discussion, of course, is why is uh, volunteerism valid, and why is it not? Why is not being a volunteerist inconsistent? So from the economic side, you have, uh, there's multiple, multiple arguments. Uh, I'll just touch upon two. Uh, one being uh, subjective va value. Uh, there, you know, all value in economic matters is subjective, meaning uh, it's, it's defined by the person. Uh, there's, an, there's a rather ancient saying, uh, you know, uh, I think, God, can't remember for the life of me right now, who is from um, one of the ancient Greeks, where it was, uh, everything is worth what its purchaser will pay for it. Mm -hmm. and, and this is known thousands of years before Christ. Mm -hmm. So this has been recognized by, you know, uh, for quite some time. And all modern economics that aren't completely retarded and, and in catastrophes and starvations, hello, Soviet Russia, um, mm -hmm. 
are premised on this basic fact. Every s modern school of economic thought recognizes this. Um, so, you know, the, the bottled water, right? The bottle of water. Hey, you know, you can pick it up at a, at a dollar store in Illinois for 99 cents. Uh, in Tijuana, it might go for two bucks or maybe, uh, you know, the equivalent of 50 cents. I don't know. It's going to vary. And that's okay. going to be due to countless, countless uh, bits of information floating about in the market that are all part of the price system. And so, you know, these things are all going to are going to vary. But that's the price. It's not the value. What the value is, is if I'm if I've just run a marathon and nobody's handing out water, which is like a crazy scenario, I know, but there's only one guy selling water. Well, I'm going to fork over some money for that bottle of water because it is of great value to my parched butt. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, if I've just been uh, you know, sitting around my house uh, playing video games all day and I got a two liter of Pepsi next to me and, uh, you know, a, a bottle, uh, you know, I have a, a tap at my disposal nearby. I'm not. I'm probably not willing to uh, pay a, a dollar or ten or whatever for that same bottle of water. It's yeah. entirely subjective. Its value is entirely subjective. Its price, I, I, it, it only reflects that. Sub subjective value, I find, is pretty easy to explain. Um, and yet, you definitely <laughs> no. You definitely know it, it varies from person to person. But not right. only does it vary from person to person, it varies from the individual based in time. If mm -hmm. I was to offer you an egg salad and liverwurst sandwich right now for $5, you would probably tell me to pound sand. Yeah, but probably. If, I don't like liverwurst. <laughs> but I can offer, I can, un, I, I, let's pretend I don't even refrigerate that sandwich, and I can offer it to you four days from now, and you will give me $50 for that sandwich, provided that I have not allowed you to eat for the last four days. Absolutely correct. And so, so there's... Yeah, and th there it is. There's that ultimate subjectivity. So when we when we're talking subjectivity, it really I can't put my subjective value on you. You can't put yours on me. It makes no logical sense to do that. Right. So it's it's an extremely important concept to understand the the subjective value because some some things don't travel to other humans, and a lot of people don't want to admit that because it hurts their feels. But but there it is. Right. And so this is one of the big. Uh underwriting problems with the state because the state imposes value and now it's perfectly fine if i want to hold certain values myself because i'm the only one uh, affected by them other than the micro bits of information transmitted through the pricing system into the rest of the market by whatever i do and purchase and 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 produce mm -hmm. but and, and you know that's how prices work not value, but prices. So, but the state imposes values. So the f number one of the first ways they do this is they control money. I mean, without that, really, they don't have a lot of control at all. But as soon as they can control money, they have immense power. And this is why the big L and little L libertarians are all opposed to the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. And that entire progressive era, because of their infliction of the state's values on the people. So that, that's, that's, that's one big part. Would you like to add anything else to the subjective value? No, I, I think we got it. Okay. Uh, so the next one, and this is, <laughs> this is uh, of paramount importance in understanding the state is the concept of distributed costs and localized benefits. Really, without this, there is no state. A state cannot be possible. It is the root of all the problems in the state be, that are economic in nature. And it is why uh, businesses become corrupt. It is literally, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's the philosopher's stone of economics in regard to the state. So distributed costs and localized benefits can be broken down in many ways, but a real simple one is, um, say there's some piece of hardware uh, that the government wants. Well, 
for, for whatever reason, right? Uh, and it's, it's an F. It's it's a, it's a it's one of those new Raptor fighters or whatever, right? So it's a billion dollars. We'll just say for nice easy round numbers because I don't like math. So a billion dollar airplane, and the state wants it, <clears throat> and we'll assume that it's that its desires, its wants are you know agreed upon by all, and everybody agrees that this is a necessary item, just for sake of argument. Well, what does that cost? So a billion dollars among 300 million people plus, that's just a couple bucks. Not a lot of people are going to, you know, cry about that because it's a very minor cost. Now, the localized benefit is to the guys making that Raptor fighter for the government and, of course, for the, gov the government itself. Now, the guys who are making the Raptor and selling it to the government are, <laughs> are receiving all the localized benefits of those distributed costs. And even if 20% of the population doesn't want the government to have this you know, Raptor fighter or whatever, the 20% doesn't really matter because the localized benefits makes the other 80% not really care because I mean it's only like three bucks out of their pocket and really to fight this this you know violation of their principles of their of their uh, you know of, of their moral right to not pay for that which they find objectionable <laughs> it, it's just it's simply destroyed because the benefits are so localized and the costs so distributed that nobody really cares I mean it's three bucks what do I care three bucks you know, I drink that more than that in a cup of coffee from Starbucks and get a snarky response in return. So, I mean, you have this really bad problem. And this is basically every aspect of the government. Mm -hmm. yep. And so, I mean, this is, this is why uh, it is so hard to fight anything with government because mm -hmm. it's hard to get people uh, motivated about, you know, a 50 cent tax increase or, right. you know, a minor... Like, you know, it's a license, big deal. I mean, only 10% of the population has to do this or whatever the case may be. The benefits are accrued to one small body of people and the costs are distributed over all the rest. So, that, you know, the, the cost benefit of actually fighting that is ridiculous. Nobody yep. wants to do that unless it's they're a great fanatics. Con it's a great conduit for grift because basically sure. the government's going to grab rob all of us for a dollar. So how, you know, what do we have to do to go out of our way to have not have this dollar stolen from us, but it definitely pays for one guy to spend an entire year working for a $2 million grant because Absolutely. at the end of the year, he gains $2 million. Yep. It, it was totally worth his time, but it's, it's, you know, just not effective for us to no. not yeah. fight back because we, we, and that's, you know, that's that inherent problem with theft. It There it is. It's right up in your face, and there's not a whole lot you could do about it. Right. And, and you know, this is, a, this is something that you hear from the left a lot in regards to their problems with big business. It's that they get all these localized benefits, and not a lot of people want to act against them. But they don't understand that that is because the state enables the distributed costs, which, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it makes, I mean, honestly, I just look at all the corrupt businesses who practice lobbying and all that as rational economic actors. They're kind of guiltless here. Uh, yeah, they're going out of their way to basically plunder the public trough, but if there wasn't a public trough, there would be no incentive to plunder it. Right. So, yeah. Right, exactly. And uh, this kind of leads into uh, one other aspect, which is the tragedy of the commons. And this mm -hmm. is a huge, um, it's a huge example in economics that you can look into and receive a lot of different, a lot of different uh, viewpoints on. But ultimately, it comes down to uh, when, when resources, when property isn't privately owned, there does not exist the motivation on the on the part of the individual to maintain it or right. to conserve it, but rather the opposite. For to a description. Plunder it, to plunder it as quickly as possible because their neighbors are going to. Yeah. Yeah. There, to, to give an idea, there's 
you know, six farmers and seven plots of land and all six farmers are going to try and graze that other, that seventh plot of land out to, to the bottom because they don't have to worry about it when it's gone. It's not their problem. Right. And all their competitors are going to as well because they all have the same motive. Right. And the same, same incentives apply. And right. this is the government writ large because the government is a commons. Right. And everything therein is subject to this problem. Right. And this is why anytime you see where the Superfund sites where massive economic or massive environmental damage has been done, the vast majority of them are state controlled and or, or military bases. Yep. Okay. So uh so moving on to uh to philosophy. Uh, and I, I'd like to throw this back into your court, uh, if you'd like, okay. and okay. if you'd be okay with that. Yeah. Sure. Um, so some of the basic some of the basic rules. Um, how about the consistency principle? Why don't you tell me about that? Um, basically, if you're going to make an exception, you have to have some sort of logical, rational reason to do it. Such as, is it okay for uh, me to murder? No, based on on the construct that is murder, the understanding of what it is. Well, is it okay for a cop to murder? Well, no, it's not okay for him to murder either, because there's no fundamental difference between me and a cop. We're both humans. To right. say that he he has a special privilege to murder, there would have to be some sort of reason behind it. So, and I think we can all agree, I can't murder, and cops can't murder. However, this gets tainted when it comes down to uh, law enforcement. So a cop can write you a ticket for X amount of dollars and tell, tell you, hey, you owe me $300 or, or this, this situation is going to escalate into violence. Whereas if I do it, people look at me like I'm crazy and it's really, it has no rational basis. It's really just based around their belief system of, what is okay for me to do? What is okay for me to not do? And right. uh, so that that's the consistency principle in a nutshell. It doesn't mean that there aren't exceptions. It means that if you're going to have to have an exception, it has to have some sort of rational basis behind it. Right. And consistency kind of rules them out by and large. Right. Uh, there's lots of uh, lifeboat scenarios where you can kind of go, I think you're missing the point here. But <laughs> yeah, the consistency principle. Right. Um, and this kind of dovetails with the principle of non-contradiction, if you'd like to provide an example of that. Uh, okay, non-contradiction is really, uh, um, A is not B. You can, you can start off with A and you can make, you know, the, the question is how many, uh, how many changes do you have to make to a car before it's no longer a car? But once, once the car is now a boat, it's no longer a car. You can't keep saying it. It's a car. And this actually has been coming up in the news lately a lot with <laughs> Bruce, Bruce, Bruce and Rachel. OK, yeah. um, just because you dress up like a woman doesn't mean that you're a woman. I don't really care what you do on your Friday nights and I don't really care what makes you feel sexy. That's completely your business. It's not mine. And I support your right to run around and do whatever the hell it is you want. That's your business. But there's there's reality at stake here. And Bruce Jenner is not a woman. And Rachel Do uh, Dolzell or whatever her name is, she's not black. I, I, don't, I don't care what they do with themselves. I don't care how they pre present themselves. That's their business. And I support their, their whole, hey, if you want to reinvent yourself, go right ahead. I enjoy your life and, and just don't think that you get to redefine reality because you say so. Right. That, that doesn't, it doesn't function like that. And I, I don't think a lot of people understand that. I don't I don't know why they just don't seem to understand that. And it, it comes to this real squishy concepts of, um, you know, I define reality with my own with my own actions like, uh, no, no, you don't. Right. So, yeah, I mean, uh, with a non contradiction, I often see that uh, in, in in terms of when with discourse with uh, people, I often see this in, in regards to. Uh, the use of euphemisms to cloud things so that you don't see the contradictions. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, you, you get this a lot. I mean, when, you know, uh, there's a thousand people 
what do you, I mean? What do you call it when a thousand people get together and they murder a million people? It's mm-hmm. called mass murder. What do you call that when the state orchestrates it? It's called war. Whoa! Right. Now wait a minute. Wait a minute. We just had <laughs> no A is A, right? <laughs> right. It doesn't matter if you put them in uniforms, does it? It doesn't. Doesn't matter who authorizes it, does it? Right. It's right. Still the same thing. Right. And so yeah, uh, that's just and, one of those those things, you know. <laughs> and and that's where and that's where we specifically have to sit down with you know our military counterparts and say, listen, it, it's not not to say that there can't be a war. Right. When 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 somebody brings war to your door, you don't really get a whole lot of options in how you're going to go about fixing that problem. That's one of the natures of war. You don't get too many options, but right. just having that basic understanding that. If you're going to war on somebody else's soil, and I've been to Iraq twice, so I'm not, po- you know, I'm not pointing fingers. I, I kind of grew up after this, but it, you know, if you're fighting in Iraq, you're an aggressor attacking somebody else's home. You are not defending your own. Right, and, it, and, and a it lot of people really have a hard time down. with that. Yeah, and it really does come down to that consistency and non-contradiction. You know, the, you know, a defensive war is simply self-defense, self-defense writ large. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, there's, I have no moral problems with the, you know, the, the justification of a defensive war by all means. That's why I have no real fault with, you know, Iraqis, you know, blowing up, uh, you know, U.S. troops or coalition troops or whatever. I don't like the fact that it's happening at all. And I really wish it wouldn't. But I understand their position. They have an aggressor right. and they're on their doorstep. Right. So, hey, I understand. I, I, I can't fault you right. anymore yeah, than I fault uh... the. The 90 it's hard to watch sometimes, especially the level of cognitive dissonance that goes into it where you just have to, because a lot, you know, we've been there and we've seen some stuff and did some stuff and yeah. you don't want to admit that, you know, you or th- there's that subliminal understanding that if I was wrong in doing that, then, oh my God, how do I reconcile this with myself? And and I don't think the the stat that, you know, 20 or 22 guys a day are killing themselves, I don't think that's an accident. I, yeah. I don't think that's an accident at all. I think they kind of, they wake up and they grow up and they come to this understanding where they have a little hard time dealing with, I mean, some of that shit, once you've seen it, it's really hard to deal with anyway. But yeah. then you get into the the culpability portion where you start to feel, oh Jesus, what did I do? And And that's a really hard thing. And, uh, you know, I, I, the, again, not finger pointing at all. This is just looking at the ugly reality of the situation. Right. And, and you know, this is one of those, this is one of those things that uh, many civilians just don't understand is, uh, okay, yeah, you sign up to get college money and get laid overseas or whatever the case may be, and then you're thrust into a war. And, hey, that was part of the contract. That could happen. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but really, you're being you're being placed into harm's way as a soldier. Not because you want to be there. Most don't. Some do. And those are the sociopaths who really need to be uh, yeah. rounded up and I don't know what. Yeah. Uh, changed at a mental yeah. level. Right? Yeah. So, uh, somebody needs to get I, a hold of their... Yeah. They, they need counseling. Hardcore. Um, yep. like Heinlein had a, uh, had a long series of, uh, of books uh, based upon this idea of the covenant and how to weed out aggression in a society, in a libertarian society. And it was really mm-hmm. interesting for, you know, uh, interesting reading for the side. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a challenge to get across to people because they have that emotional challenge of facing the consequences of what if they're wrong. Yep. And, and you know, for and, most, that's just too much. And you know what? A lot they they grab kids at eighteen for a reason because you can't really talk a whole lot of three. It's it, it you know there's a a little bit of uh, hey we got you know we're looking for younger strapping men, but but at a certain point you're also looking for people who don't necessarily understand. Um, and what better institution to get them at and a yeah a, a public education. Yep. Yeah, uh, that's where I worked primarily as a recruiter, so that's yep. entirely valid. Yep. Yeah. So um, I guess the last point would just be uh, uh, go look up your fallacies because it's really important that, I mean, at least it, I, I'm going to assume that some military guys out there, maybe a couple of you are on the left, 
but I know the vast majority of you are, you know, on the right or in the libertarian camp. And uh, look up your fallacies. Make sure you're not making bad arguments for yourself. The, right. the, burden of, the burden of proof is on he who makes the active claim. So when we're both sitting in a room, not doing nothing with each other, and one person says, you have to pay taxes, even if you say we have to pay taxes, you're the one making the active claim, burden of proof is on you. And if you're not willing to ask yourself these kinds of questions, I mean, just, just think about yeah. what kind of person what kind of person is is unwilling to answer their own questions, be truthful with themselves. You don't owe me nothing, but you you probably should be telling yourself the truth at a minimum. Right. So yeah, good show, and uh, just yep. just remember, just remember to uh, keep your eye open for that gun in the room. Whenever yep. you hear the the unsubstantiated claims that always have the emotional reaction when challenged. Mm -hmm. There's somebody who's unwilling to face the fact that they, that they are pointing a gun at you with their opinion and that that is what backs up their opinion. Yep. Yep. It's a, it's not a, it's not a quick process. I mean, I, I did it in two years and I'm told it was extremely fast for me. So um, next week is going to be news. So uh, we'll be looking at the, the latest news stuff and just kind of dragging through, uh, you know, what, what, what is the, the voluntarist perspective of this and why? So uh, tune in next week, and uh, thanks for stopping by. TheSeedsOfLiberty.com, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. Have a good night. Good night.